title of chapter seven is the road to the revolution. So finally, we're here. We're going to be talking about how the revolution came about um, before next chapter, we get into the battles that occurred. You know, the last, last part of this chapter, we'll get into the beginning of it, the first battle, but uh, we'll reserve that for the next chapter. But let's talk about the roots of the revolution. And I think the roots of the revolution, you have to go all the way back to 1607 the first voyage to Jamestown. That's when the roots of the revolution really started because those settlers who got off to mine for gold in Jamestown were really rebelling against the mother country. They were, they were leaving because think about it is that they weren't coming back. I mean, it was a long journey six to eight weeks to sail across the Atlantic Ocean the chances of them hopping on a boat and going back were slim so you were basically dead to your family in England when you left um, the goodbye was pretty much forever so yeah it was a it's not like today where you could go anywhere in the world and get back rather quickly because of airplanes, but obviously then it took a lot longer. So yeah, the roots of the revolution really began in 1607 when the first settlers stepped off that ship at Jamestown. And then they quickly realized that distance weakens authority. Right? The, the fact that the, the distance between Europe, England specifically, and America was 3,000 plus miles really made the authority of the mother country, England, uh, go way down. Obviously, they can't, they, with the lack of communication, um, to get a message across the ocean took months. And then you had to wait for the return, you know, uh, message back. So you're talking about long time, you know, three to four, sometimes five months to get an answer um, to, to your question that you might have. So distance really weakens authority and great distance weakens authority greatly. Um, you know, the co colonists really felt that, like they were physically separate from Europe and why wouldn't they? It's not like you could hop on the internet and figure out what's going on or, or speak to people. You can. So you were, when you left, you were pretty much leaving for good. Um, you could see the map here shows you the distance. Um, gives you an appreciation for how far it is between the mother country, England, over here, all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, distance weakens authority. Now here, here's a, a concept that everyone must know and understand in this class, and that's mercantilism. Mercantilism is based on the belief that a country's economic wealth could be measured by the amount of gold or silver in its treasury. Basically, what, what your wealth is as a country, how, how wealthy you are is based on how much gold you have. So how do you get more gold? Well, you had to bring money in. And the way that you brought money in was to have factories and for you to export more than you import. If you're a net exporter of goods as a country, then you are gonna, the money's going to come in and money makes money. If you're a net importer of a good, like what we call the third world countries are, they don't have factories and they must import all their goods, all their clothing and things that they need, their everyday items, then those everyday items are gonna get consumed, right? Clothes are gonna be worn and they're gonna be worn out, they're gonna be thrown away. Um, Furniture is gonna be used and then thrown away. In that case, that's not making you any money. So how you make money is you produce goods in factories and then you send them out and the money comes in and then makes that, that mother country stronger. Uh, so that's the mercantilism theory is based on, Hey, we got to find a way to, to build factories and then have, have raw materials like for instance, wood to make furniture. And then the furniture you sell, you send out on ships to other countries and the money comes in. The manufactured items go out and the money comes in and money makes money. So yeah, that's their philosophy, of the philosophy of mercantilism. Now, what these colonies need, like say for instance, England. 
I go back to this map and you could see that England is an island, right? You're talking about it's, it's a small island over here. Uh, they don't have very many natural resources. They don't have a whole bunch of trees. So in order to wo provide wood to the factories to make furniture, right, they had to go all the way over here to their colony, get the trees, put them on ships, bring them back over and, and that way. And, uh, you know, and, and another example would be later on cotton. They, you have cotton here, bring the cotton back to the factories and produce, produce clothing. Um, so raw materials colony, mother country has access to those raw materials that they bring back to the factories where they make manufactured goods and then they send the manufactured goods out to the rest of the world. That's mercantilism. And one of the other jobs of the colony was not only to provide raw materials, but also to be a market for English manufactured goods. So the items that they produce in the factories, they're going to send over to America and Americans were expected to purchase those items and they would. And that's how that country would make money. Uh, mercantilism. So that is the, the, the theory. The navigation acts are the laws that make that, that guide mercantilism, like, like rules that the mother country puts on the colony. Um, for instance, the colonies were not allowed to trade with anybody else other than England, unless England specifically said that they would allow that, which occasionally they did. Um, saying that the uh, colonists had to use ships that were built in England. So it would it would promote their business of making ships in, in England. And then the colonists would buy those ships and they'd use those ships. So they would have all these different rules to restrict the colonies from being able to trade with anyone else. So the, the, the philosophy of mercantilism basically is this, is that the mother country has colonies and the colonies are there for the good of the mother countries. And that, you know, they could, the mother country could do whatever they want with the colonies. Now, England's philosophy was not as rigid as, say, France or Spain. They allowed their colonies to dabble in trade with other countries occasionally. And also, the mother country would pay the colonies for, the say, the trees that they would take out. They'd pay the colonies for that. They paid the colonies for tobacco so they could make manufactured cigarettes and put manufactured into um, you know, things that they could put in pipes, like they, they could put, you know, people were smoking pipes at that time. <clears throat> so yeah, navigation acts are just the rules that are set. I always use the example of this, is that <clears throat> we have a philosophy that murder is wrong, of course, but you can't just go around in, your, in this country and say murder is wrong. You have to have rules, like murder one, murder two, manslaughter, so those are the rules, those are the, the laws that govern our philosophy that murder is wrong. So navigation acts are the laws that govern the idea of mercantilism. So that's, that's the philosophy of having colonies. And back then, England, being a small country, didn't have many natural resources. So in order to be a world power and have a lot of money, have a lot of gold in their treasury, they had to have colonies. Now, there are, there are definitely, uh, for, the, for the mother country, or excuse me, for the colonies, there are merits or good things about mercantilism. London paid. Eng the, uh, England, they paid for whatever they took. Um, the tobacco going back and forth that allowed the colonies to exist and have items from England and clothes and, and uh, all, all kinds of different things that they wanted. Uh, and also, the colonists enjoyed the rights of an Englishman. Uh, so any kind of rights that people had in England, they also had those same rights in the colonies. And how about this too, this is big, is that the colonies were protected by the strongest army and navy in the world. Uh, the English navy, the English army, they protected the colonies. And the other thing is too, England was really liberal about enforcing the Navigation Acts. They really didn't enforce them very often. Um, we enter a period here, and we've talked about it before in this class of salutary neglect. The mother country, England, basically neglected the colonies, which allowed the colonies to trade with whomever they wanted, and they were able to make money and find trade partners and really get strong enough to be able to defeat England, the mother country.
down the road. So salutary, meaning it was a positive, it ended up being a positive, but at the time the colonies didn't think it was a, a positive. They felt neglected, but in the end, it's why they ended up being strong enough to be able to defeat them. So speaking of the trade that went on, you have this going on, that the, the gray arrows, the gray lines and arrows here are, are uh, that's triangular trade. We've talked about that a number of times in class. It was illegal. Um, England would forbid this, but they, because of salutary neglect, they didn't do anything about it. The blue here is, a lot of it is trade between, like we've been talking about, the whole mercantilism idea, trade between England and its colonies back and forth. For It says here, naval stores, which are like trees and things that the Navy would put a flag on and say, this is for mother country, England. Whale oil, ginger, pig and bar iron, so they could make things out of metal, lumber, all these things were, were uh, raw materials that were found in the colonies and they would be sent to the mother country, in which case they would turn around and make manufactured goods. As you see right here, the manufactured goods would go to, to the colonies. Yeah, as I've said before, that uh, trade was the lifeblood of the colonies. It's how they existed. It's how they made money. It's why they ended up being successful in the long run. There are some negatives to mercantilism. Definitely. And, and again, you know, hey, we're heading straight down the road of uh, the Revolutionary War. So, you know, there's going to be some bad things about mercantilism. And the colonies basically felt offended. Like, you can't tell us who we could trade with and who we cannot trade with. So that was a, a big negative for them is someone telling them what they can and can't do. And that someone happens to be 3,000 miles away. And that someone happens to be a lot smaller than the colonies. Um, they couldn't get the right prices for the goods that they wanted. And they, the colonists really felt that their economic initiative was stifled, which means they couldn't trade with whoever they want to. And they were always being observed by England. But we know because of salutary neglect, that really wasn't happening. But what's important in this class is that's what the colonies perceived. The colonists felt like that was happening. So they're going to they're gonna eventually fight. The Sugar Act. This is a big moment in the history of uh, the mother country, England, and the colony's relationship here. When England made the decision to ask for, or I should say demand, that the colonies shoulder one-third of the burden for redcoats that protect them in the colonies. They're asking the colonists to pay. And how they were going to get money out of the colonies is they were going to, they were going to pass, a series, pass a series of acts that are going to, that are, their sole purpose was to raise revenue to pay for the Redcoats coming over to protect them after the French and Indian War. So you can see the date here is 1764. That's less than a year after the end of the French and Indian War. We know that everything changed after that. The colony started to be able to feel like they could uh, compete with England, maybe even defeat them. And England passed the Sugar Act, which was a, a very small tax on sugar. And it was meant to, you know, try to get some money out of them. Uh, it, it said, hey, we'll allow you to trade with the French West Indies for sugar. However, we're going to take a piece of the action is what England was saying. Um, and then again, that was a series of, of laws that were passed, as we're going to talk about, that asking the colonists to pay or shoulder one third of the debt. Another act, and maybe one of the biggest acts that helps bring on the Revolutionary War, was the Stamp Act. And uh, this act was passed by Mother Country England, again, to try to get money out of the colonies to pay for the Redcoats. Um, so, understand this, that after the French and Indian War, England was broke. They didn't have any money. And that's why they're asking the colonists to shoulder one third of the cost for maintaining a garrison of 100,000 redcoats in America to protect the American colonists. They feel like they can't afford to do that unless they get help from America. Thus, the Sugar Act was passed. Thus, the Stamp Act was passed. And the Stamp Act was, was a tax on all paper goods. So whether it was a ream of paper, whether it was a deck of cards, whether it was a marriage license, um, anything like that, anything that was made of paper, which was a lot of things at that time, newspapers, um, pamphlets that had essays written on it that people liked to read, there was that tax that was put on it. 
they would at, they would put a stamp on it. And I'm not talking about a stamp that you would put on an envelope, like a, a, a sticky stamp or something. I'm talking about a, a stamp that they would, it, it was made out of, um, it was made out of wax and they would affix it to all the, the, the paper. Um, and then, so like, if you, if you ever see like on a wine bottle, sometimes they have like a, a wax stamp on there. That's what it was like. The stamp collectors would come from England and they'd go to all the merchants in the big cities like New York and Philadelphia and Boston. And they'd say, all merchants are required to purchase these stamps that you would have to put on all paper items. Um, so then the cost of the stamps would be put on the item. So it, it's just like a sales tax. We pay for an item at the store and then we pay a small sales tax that goes to the government. And that's what was happening here. The merchants would then have to raise the price of the goods. So it would fall, the paying for it would fall on the, on the colonists and they weren't happy with that. And the biggest reason they weren't happy with that is because, and Benjamin Franklin argued this to England, is that it's an internal tax and not an external tax. And what I mean by that, it was a tax on goods that were produced in the colonies. For example, Boston had a newspaper. They produced it. The, the, the topics that were in this newspaper, everything was written that was written was about what was happening in Boston. Well, England made them put a stamp on that, and then they got some of the price that people would pay for the newspaper part of that would go because of the stamp to England. And the colonists said, you can't do that. How can you tax goods, uh, tax goods internally, things that we make here in the colonies? And, and, you know, they, they actually, Benjamin Franklin is the one who said, well, tax us externally, but not internally. Well, the idea of the stamp act, um, was this guy right here. His name was George Grenville, and he was what they called the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So in America, it'd be the equivalent of the Secretary of the Treasury, the person who's responsible for the money in a country. And he's the one who decided that we were going to try to get one third of the price that it costs to have a garrison of redcoats in America. We're going to get that out of the colonists, and we're going to do it through a series of taxes. And uh, he's, here's some of his taxes. The Sugar Act in 1764, um, we talked about that. The Currency Act, we'll talk about in a few minutes here. The Quartering Act, we'll be talking about also. And of course, the one that we just talked about right now, which is the Stamp Act, probably the one that caused the most hysteria in the colonies. They were really angry about that. Here on the bottom, you have three different types of stamps that they would sell. Uh, again, you'd have someone come from England who had these stamps and go to every merchant and say, you are required by English law to buy these stamps and put it on all paper products. Now, a couple of these uh, pictures right here will show you some of the hysteria caused by the Stamp Act. Um, they would take these uh, tax, the people who, who would come around and sell the stamps. Um, here, you, they would uh, tar and feather them. They put really hot tar on them and then dump feathers all over them and hum humiliate them. And they'd make them run around the, they put a, you know, some a rope around their neck and they'd drag them around uh, Boston. And so people would laugh at them and throw things at them, just try to humiliate them. You see them uh, as a torture uh, technique, they would pour tea down their throat. And we'll talk about tea here in a few minutes, but uh, you know, they'd hang them up by their pants or they riot. So there was a lot of resistance due to the Stamp Act and it caused some, I would say, unity in the colonies because the colonists felt like they were doing something to try to get rid of the Stamp Act. And here's, here's four things that happened uh, that was uproar because of the Stamp Act. One, the anger because it was an internal tax, not an external tax that we just talked about. It was the statement that was created by uh, or uttered by and actually created and uttered by Benjamin Franklin, which was no taxation without representation. It was a saying that they could chant in the streets, and they did. They would chant no taxation without representation. And it was bonding, it was unifying when they would do this. The creation of a gang of people called the Sons and Daughters of Liberty, who would just, uh, their job became to protest the Stamp Act. And then the last thing here would be a more official unity in the colonies by uh, having a meeting that's called the Stamp Act Congress, a meeting of people who uh, from the, all the 
colonies that would protest the Stamp Act. We're going to talk about each one of these. So, so first of all, I, I, I told you that, you know, Ben Franklin actually got on a ship, went all the way to London and argued with Parliament and said that, you know, they want that it, the colonists want actual representation. They want somebody, there should be somebody from America that would sit in Parliament and represent the colonies. And England refused and said, you know, you have virtual representation. And that meant that basically that every member of Parliament virtually represents everybody else. So they, they wouldn't give them an actual representative in Parliament. So Benjamin Franklin was not happy and he said no taxation without representation. The representation mean, meant he wanted a representative in Parliament, which never happened. The Sons and Daughters of Liberty, Samuel Adams and Paul Revere headed up this group. Samuel Adams, you might know of him because of Samuel Adams' beer, but he was a go-getter uh, in the colonies, and he was kind of like the, uh, he, he, he drove the fighting spirit of the colonists and, and pushed towards revolution. He was very radical. And Paul Revere, who's a silversmith, um, we'll talk about him toward the end of this chapter. Um, you might know him from uh, the po uh, poet Longfellow, who, the midnight, who wrote The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. So yeah, these groups were mostly middle class, um, mostly middle to upper, upper class who were second tier aristocracy. Second tier aristocracy. So an interesting thing, you know, when, in regard to arist the first tier versus second tier aristocracy, first tier aristocracy were mostly the plantation owners that were really close to England. They were loyalists. They were loyal to the English crown. Second tier aristocracy, not as rich, wanted to be first tier aristocracy. So, hey, you know, they stood to benefit tremendously from a victory over England because first tier aristocracy would be ousted from America because they're loyalists. So we'll talk about that more as we go. Mostly in class, I'll talk about that. And then the other thing that we discussed a few minutes ago here was a Stamp Act Congress. 27 delegates from nine different colonies attended a meeting in New York because they were angry about the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act was all throughout the colonies and the colonists were not happy. And at this Stamp Act Congress, they did something that was really, really important. They organized boycotts. They decided, we are going to boycott British goods. Any goods that were in stores, which or merchants were selling in these stores that were from England, which was almost everything, not everything, but almost everything, they said, we're not gonna buy them anymore. And it was so successful. This is big now. Listen carefully. It was so successful that England decided to repeal the Stamp Act because they were losing money because of the uh, actions of the Stamp Act Congress and their boycotts. That was big. The colonists thought this was the greatest thing. I mean, think about it. Think about the unity that would be created from this. They they had a cause, get rid of the Stamp Act. They created a meeting, 27 delegates, nine different colonies, and they rebelled and they boycotted and they, you know, embarrassed the tax collectors by tarring and feathering them. And you know what? It worked. And that was unifying. So now the colonists realize that how do we get our way? We just throw a temper tantrum. We kick, we scream just like that little kid. And once the colon, once that uh, mother country, England, gave in, it was on. They realized that this is how we get our way. Just like if you have a kid and you give in to that kid, after, after that kid throws a temper tantrum, you're creating a monster. England was creating a monster by doing away with the Stamp Act because the colonists were really fired up by this. Now, they did pass a declaratory act, which was useless. Basically, England said, okay, we know we're giving in here, but don't think that this is ever going to happen again. We declare that the mother country, England, will pass any act anytime we want to. That's all it said. That's it. It wasn't a month, no money. It was no money changed hands, anything like that. The declaratory act simply declared that we'll pass any act anytime we want to. 
Here was another big one too. You want to take, talk about, you know, really invading people's privacy. This was one of them, the quartering act. So Eng England was sending troops, redcoats over to America to squash a lot of the problems that, that were going on. People were getting really upset and angry and they were angry with England. So they decided they're gonna send more redcoats to, to squash all this. Well, they didn't have any place for these redcoats to uh, live and stay. So the Quartering Act was passed in 1765 that said the colonists were required to house and feed redcoats in their house. They, they had to have take one redcoat in and they would give them food, they give them a, a roof over their head, and uh, yeah, colonists didn't like that very much at all, taking away their right, of, their right of privacy. In fact, when we create our constitution later on, that's one of the things we put in the first 10 amendments known as the Bill of Rights is uh, that government could never quarter troops in your house. Well, New York refused to quarter troops, so Great Britain acted by taking away their uh, colonial assembly, their, their right to be able to decide their own taxes and make their own laws. And you take that away from these uh, colonies and they were not gonna be happy. So hope, hopefully you're seeing that the build up to the Revolutionary War, it's happening. The Townsend Acts were passed by parliament and it, it, it was basically, okay, we, we did away with the Stamp Act because it was an internal tax. Well, Ben Franklin said in Parliament that it's okay to tax us externally. So here you go. Here's a tax on goods that you bring into the colonies. This is what Parliament is telling the colonists on glass, on lead, on tea, things that are imported into the colonies, there's a tax on that. But at this point, you could probably understand that the colonists are in no mood for any taxes at all. And after, especially after boycotting. So what are they going to do? They're going to boycott more. And they're going to try to get their way. Currency Act was, a, was an act that was passed in 1764 that demanded that all products from, that would be bought from England had to be paid for in the British pound, the British um, money. And really, the British pound was the only money in the colonies that was every colony accepted. It's like universally accepted in the colonies. Um, it was really confusing that Massachusetts had money and New York had money and Georgia had money and you couldn't use Massachusetts money in New York or anywhere else, but you could use the pound, the British pound anywhere. So when the colony said all, all money will be paid, excuse me, the mother country said all money will be paid in the British pound, that would drain money away from the um, colonies and they didn't like that very much for obvious reasons. All right, um, the first ever bloodshed. First ever bloodshed in the colonies regarding, you know, uh, the two countries, the mother country, England and the colonists happened at the Boston Massacre. And this picture right here shows you uh, reconstruction of the, where the Boston Massacre happened. That's in Boston now, but that's a remake. Um, that's exactly where it was, but you could see the high-rise buildings around it. Obviously, that weren't there at the time. So, so this is what it looked exactly what they what it looked like, and um, it's where it was. So, kind of envision that as I'm talking about what happened at the Boston Massacre on March 5th, 1770, when a crowd of about 60 people that were led by an African American man by the name of Crispus Attucks, and they that was what a lot of people did at the time. There was a lot of anger that was directed at the Redcoats. People didn't like them. Um, so they were calling them names. They were yelling and screaming at them and the crowd got bigger and bigger and bigger. Next thing you know, they started throwing s snowballs at these, uh, red coats that were surrounding this building and protecting it. Well, it was snowing, it was dark. Um, and, uh, the, uh, red coats were really, um, nervous and concerned. And as the crowd started moving in closer and closer, they, they uh, lifted their muskets and pointed them at the crowd and told them to get crowd and told them to get back. And uh, one snowball hit a uh, red coat in the head and he, and he went backwards and his uh, musket went off. And that caused the other red coats 
to open fire. And you could see this Paul Revere engraving um, on how they were aggressively attacking the colonists. It's not necessarily what happened. Um, these eight redcoats uh, were felt threatened. They opened fire and a number of colonists were killed um, and they were put on trial. Well, these red redcoats were, and here's another artist depiction of that. The redcoats were just to, to end this story about this is the, the, the redcoats were found innocent of the charges and they were defended by none other than future second president of the United States and cousin of Samuel Adams, John Adams. John Adams was a lawyer and he was a patriot and he didn't like the redcoats, but he said, facts are facts. And, and he said, these redcoats were provoked. It was self-defense. And, uh, you know, he ended up getting all the redcoats off on the charges. There were a lot of people that were not happy with John Adams, but he did it anyways because he felt like that was his, his, uh, his occupation as a lawyer. He was supposed to defend people he, who he felt were innocent, and he felt that these redcoats were innocent, and he got them all off on the charges. Uh, Crispus Attucks, the runaway slave, African-American slave who was uh, in kind of, you know, the instigator of this whole thing, was the first person to be shot um, by the, the Redcoats. So, yeah. But you could see just how dangerously uh, heated this is becoming. And, it, and, it's gonna, and it's gonna be, you know, the first bloodshed uh, that, and at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. All right, I'm gonna pause it here.